Okay, now we're going to study Philippians chapter 3. So look at verse 1. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Paul is all about rejoicing in this epistle, as I'm sure you've seen. He says it at least nine or ten times. He tells them to rejoice in the Lord. The key words being, in the Lord. We may not be going through good times in our life, but we can still rejoice in the Lord and in who He is. Paul says to write the same things to you. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So he is writing the same things. He's repeating in himself. And he says it isn't grievous for him, and for them it is safe. And that's because it is good to have repetition. One of the best ways to learn a truth is by repeating it over and over. It is fun to study unique and different topics, but there are some things you need to hear over and over again. Things like eternal security, heaven, hell, things about the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, if you hear those things and have them settled in your mind, it will be safe for you. It is safe to hear about heaven over and over. It keeps you heavenly minded. Hearing about hell over and over gives you a burden for lost people. And the best way to memorize scripture is by repeating five words from a verse at a time to yourself. Repetition is a good thing. What are some things we should constantly be reminded of? Paul gives us some things in Philippians 3. If you look at verse 2, it says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. First, we see that we should be reminded and warned about false prophets and teachers. Paul says, Beware of dogs. And I don't believe he's referring to a pit bull or any type of four-legged dog. In Second Peter, the apostle Peter refers to false prophets as dogs. If you look at Second Peter 2.22, it says, But it is happened to them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Paul also says, Beware of evil workers. A very smart person said one time that everything bad is a good thing twisted. It is a good thing to be a worker. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 talks about how we should work with our own hands. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, If any would not work, neither should he eat. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. So we see a man should work to feed his belly and provide for his family. Hard honest work is a good thing. It's a sin to be lazy. And there are evil people who aren't lazy. There are some evil people who are less lazy than many Christians, and they are the evil workers. They work with their own hands. But everything bad is a good thing twisted. It's good to work, but not to work evil. And many men are hard at work, doing evil things and inventing evil things. Psalms 115.4 says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. There are many evil workers. The preacher says in Ecclesiastes 4.3 that the child who hasn't been born is better off because he hasn't seen the evil work done under the sun. He also says in Ecclesiastes 8.11 the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. The reason for this is because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. When God smacks a person down for doing wickedly, it is more of a blessing than a, than a curse because the person might stop the evil things he's doing. In James, in the book of James, in verse or chapter 3 and 16, it says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. A teacher or preacher who is causing envy and strife is associated with confusion in every evil work. He may be teaching the right doctrine, but hindering you in other ways. He may be filling you with hatred and paranoia, making you lose confidence in fellow Christians and other Bible teachers, causing strife among Christians. He may be making you think the Illuminati and Jesuits are under every pillow and that the slender man is hiding in your closet. But Paul also says, beware of the concision. 
The next verse shows us what the concision is. Philippians 3, 3 says, For we are the circumcision. Paul is warning them against false prophets who want to get you back under the law. In this case, he is talking about men who say you have to be circumcised to be saved. And if you look at Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after, ma after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And then verse 24 in the same chapter says, For as much as we have heard, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. You see this today mostly when it comes to water baptism. Countless times I have been told water baptism is necessary for salvation, and that would be adding works to the gospel. Paul makes it clear when he says, I came not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, showing that baptism even isn't even a part of the gospel. And he doesn't even mention water baptism in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Water baptism is a good thing. Get water baptized. But that's something you do after you're saved, after you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And doesn't make you saved. Doesn't make you any more saved. But Philippians 3.3 3 says, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So Paul is letting them know he isn't like those false prophets. He is the circumcision. He has the real thing. He has the spiritual circumcision. Colossians 2.11 says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision, made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. That saying is, when you are saved, God performs a surgery on you, and cuts your soul loose from your flesh. When you sin in the flesh after salvation, those sins aren't applied to your soul anymore. So Paul reminds us to beware of these false prophets, he also continues to remind us about the danger of having confidence in the flesh. Uh, verse 3 said, And have no confidence in the flesh. Paul says he worships God in the Spirit and rejoices in Christ Jesus. He isn't rejoicing in his fleshly works and self-righteousness like these false prophets who are saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. They're trusting in their own good deeds, their own self-righteousness and fleshly works. He says, which worship God in the spirit. So worship is spiritual. Worship doesn't mean you have to run around screaming and moving your body a certain way. That would be something outward. I'm not saying that stuff is wrong, but just because a person doesn't run around and scream doesn't mean he's not worshiping. Just as much as the person who is jumping and running around and screaming. Sometimes men don't realize that Christians are individuals. Bible reading and Bible believing, believing the Bible, creates individuals and not copies of others. We're not all the same. One person may be more emotional and scream. Another person may be quiet and not screaming. But they say, well, you would scream at a ball game. I don't know about that. I've never shouted at a ball game. Something we need to learn is men are different. I may not scream like the next guy. And the other guy may not be quiet like me, and that's fine as well. I don't believe all Christians are doing that type of thing just for show in front of others, but I believe the best wor worship is done in private. Sometimes it seems like Christians, Christians think the only way they can get to God, learn about God, or get close to God, or even worship God, is on Sundays when they go to church, but you can worship God anywhere. You can learn the Bible outside of church. And I think if you can get people to realize that, that they don't have to wait till Sunday and Wednesday to get right with God, to get saved, to read the Bible, then uh, they're going to be a lot better off in their Christian walk. Some people think that they can't study the Bible on their own, read the Bible on their own. They have to wait until Sunday. And it shouldn't be that way. But John 4.24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Paul didn't have confidence in the flesh. None of us are good enough to have that confidence, but Paul probably came the closest. 
Philippians 3, 4 says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul believes he is more worthy to have confidence in the flesh. And he th thinks he's more worthy than the men who actually do have confidence in the flesh. He goes on to give some of his credentials that he had before he was saved. Look at verse 5 and 6. It says, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which was in the law, blameless. He was circumcised the eighth day. And that, it, and that is when God said a child should be circumcised when he is eight days old. And he said that in Genesis seventeen twelve. So he had an advantage on that. He was of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. So he was never seen as a Gentile dog. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, meaning he took his religion seriously. And when he says as touching the law of Pharisee, he's showing how strict he was. And the Pharisees were the most strict when it came to outward things and living a certain way outwardly. He explains in verse 6 how that he was so zealous he was willing to persecute and kill other Christians. And he says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. We know that no one ever kept the law perfectly besides Jesus Christ. But a man could still be blameless when it came to the law. When he did break the law, he would offer the proper sacrifice and he would then be blameless. He would have temporary forgiveness. And many non-dispensationalists will accuse dispensationalists of believing Old Testament saints were saved by never breaking the law, not even one time. And then they'll say that can't be true because no one ever kept the law perfectly. Which no one did ever keep the law perfectly. And we know that no one ever kept all the law completely. And another thing, we also know that no man ever got to the third heaven outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. The men in the Old Testament, if they died and were uh, righteous, they got to paradise in the heart of the earth by keeping the law, offering the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it, and not just this, but also by faith. Not only this, but also by the mercy and grace of God. If it wasn't for God's mercy and grace, then everyone who ever lived would be put in hell. And that is more slander the non-dispensationalists will spew out about Peter Ruckman, probably the most well-known dispensationalist that they bash constantly on a regular basis. And other ones like Sam Gipp and Robert Breaker, they lie and say Ruckman didn't even believe there was grace in the Old Testament. And that is what you get by listening to hearsay and not actually reading what the man taught. But he plainly says in his book on dispensationalism, he, this is an exact quote, Grace will be found in every dispensation, and there is no such thing as a dispensation called the dispensation of grace. But many well-meaning non-dispensationalists are in such a hurry to defend their belief that they will slander him and others to preach their belief and get you to believe it. But there's always been grace. But after Paul gives us his credentials in Philippians 3, he says this in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. The things you counted as gain before you were saved, you should now see them as loss and be ashamed. Paul is... Not ashamed, or he is now ashamed for persecuting the church. And 1 Corinthians 15, 9 says, For I am the least of the apostles. This is Paul talking. That I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. If you're doubting your salvation, a good sign that you're saved is that you're ashamed of the things you used to do like Paul was. Or you're ashamed of the wicked things you... You're doing presently. Romans 6.21 says, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. If you keep on doing the sins that you're doing, you're going to eventually die. Quicker than you were going to in the first place. You may have felt guilt or some kind of shame over sin before salvation, but nothing like you do now. 
For instance, before I was saved, I, ha I had no shame when it came to listening to filthy music. Now, since I've been saved, even if I'm a little backslid at the moment, or whenever it is, I'm ashamed for anyone to get the idea that I like or support dirty music. So I, at my most backslid time since I was saved, I wouldn't listen to dirty music. I was too ashamed. That is one of the reasons I don't like contemporary music. It sounds just like the wicked music you hear everywhere else. If you're driving down the road listening to contemporary music, or you're going to a church that, that has contemporary music, People can drive by and say they're listening to worldly, wicked music, and it can hurt your testimony. In Philippians 3, 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. All that stuff you did before should be counted loss for Christ. He no longer sees it as gain. He no longer sees persecuting the church and being a Pharisee and a Hebrew of the Hebrews and all this stuff. He doesn't see that as gain. He's no longer trying to get to God by those things. And that is what true repentance is. Everybody's always getting in a big fight about repentance. When you got saved, you didn't quit your sins. You quit relying on your own righteousness to get you to heaven. And started relying on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You counted your, your own righteousness as a loss. Our own righteousness can't save us. Quitting a certain sin won't save you. Living right after salvation won't save you. It's Jesus Christ and believing on Him and His finished work He did at Calvary. That's what saves. And Philippians 3.8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Those are strong words from the Apostle Paul. He pretty much says those works he did aren't worth dung. A reminder to not have confidence in the flesh. So he reminds us about false prophets. He reminds us not to have confidence in the flesh. He counts all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Second Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. The best way to get knowledge about the Savior is by spending time in His book that tells you all about Him. At the end of the verse, He says that I may win Christ. And this isn't referring to salvation because we can't earn Jesus Christ. He offers Himself to us freely. Romans chapter 5 showed us that salvation is a free gift, but in the Christian life, after you have been saved, you can win some things, earn rewards, aim to get a prize, shoot for a crown, and you do this by serving God. Philippians 3, 9 says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is, which is of God by faith. The only way to go to heaven is to be found in him. As the beginning of Philippians 3, 9 says, Not having your own righteousness. If you're found outside of Jesus Christ with your own self-righteousness, then that's how you wind up in hell when you die. Self-righteousness is of the law. True righteousness comes by the faith of Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Galatians three twenty six, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Acts sixteen thirty one says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Moreover, moreover brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. How did he die? He died by shedding his blood. We are saved by grace, through faith in his blood. Romans 3.25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption 
through his blood the forgiveness of sins. But moving on, next Paul reminds us that Christians suffer. Philippians 3, 10 and 11 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He knows Christ in the sense that he's saved, but he wants a deeper knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To know the power of his resurrection involves suffering, and suffering for Jesus Christ, because... Jesus Christ suffered before he was resurrected. You have fellowship of his sufferings when you stick your neck out for him and take persecution. You may not get the chance to physically die for Jesus Christ, but you can be made conformable unto his death. And we do this by dying daily. The Bible talks about dying daily. Romans 6.11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And 1 Corinthians 15.31 says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Your sinful flesh feels like it has to have sinful things to live and to gratify yourself. And when you refuse to pamper the flesh and give in to its desires, it can make it feel like it is suffocating or dying. You die daily when you put down the lusts of your flesh. We are made conformable unto his death when we die daily. Philippians 3.11 and 12 says, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. Paul says he hasn't yet attained, meaning he still has some things in his life and some things in his flesh he is struggling with. Notice he says it isn't already perfect. He isn't already perfect. Some of the holiness crowd, they think that they are already perfect when they aren't even close to being as sinless as even Paul was. They think that their flesh is born again when no one's flesh gets born again. You still have the same sinful flesh even after you're saved. And Paul lets us know on several occasions he wasn't sinless. Paul is not talking about attaining salvation. If we suffer for Jesus here, dying daily, we can attain into the resurrection of the dead. Jesus had to do some suffering before he was resurrected. And that's what Paul is talking about. Philippians 3.12 says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that at if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. So Paul is trying to apprehend or to catch or get a hold of what has already gotten a hold of him. He knows he isn't already per perfect. He is trying his best to be conformed to the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Even though it isn't possible in the flesh, doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And we don't officially attain this perfection and this sinlessness until the rapture, at that time we will get our sinless glorified bodies. But this has been Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 12.